Love, I'm so pleased to meet with you this evening once again to observe the beginning of our Passion Week. And I pray that the grace of God will be sufficient to us as you follow us on a daily basis. We will be teaching out the word of God to you through this channel. Since the situation in the world, and especially in our city, does not permit one-on-one uh, -on -one contact. So I pray that the grace of God will be sufficient to us in the name of Jesus. Our Lord and Father, we glorify your name, we thank you for the grace you have given to us to begin this Passion Week. Thank you, Lord, for the experience of the 40 days, the strength and the grace you have given to us to wait upon you. We really trust in your word that those who wait upon you shall renew their strength, they will run and not be weary, and that they will renew their strength like the eagles. So my Lord and my Father, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, speak to us once again and release your blessings upon us. Holy Spirit, use everything in me to your glory and bless our listeners through Christ our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Beloved, we will be considering the Gospel according to Matthew uh, chapter 26. We we'll commence our reading from verse 14 to verse 29. The priest does. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priest and asked how much they would pay him to betray Jesus. And they gave him thirty pieces of silver. From that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? As you go into the city, he told them, You will see a certain man. Tell him, the teacher says, My time has come, and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus told them, and prepared the Passover meal there. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve disciples. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, Am I the one, Lord? He replied, One of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me. For the Son of Man must die as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it would be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better that, ma that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, you have said As they were as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this is, take this and eat, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink this wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Beloved, I caption this message. Loyalty and obedience. Loyalty and obedience. We, the word loyalty, especially in the society today where the political class is trying to override uh, every aspect of life, and the word loyalty is becoming very common and at times uh, misunderstood. In the bid to be loyal, some people have gone extra mile. But in my own aspect, I look at loyalty as a feeling 
or a state of being in strong support for someone or something that you trust. A feeling or a state of being in support, very strong support for someone or for something that you believe in. And obedience, in my own idea, could be described as an act of taking a decisive decision in support of a guideline without questionable observations. It can also be seen as a state of taking instead of taking a decision or accepting direction without any bias. This is my own idea of loyalty. And throughout the period of passion, you could see Jesus Christ directing his disciples towards what will be at the end, what is going to be falling. Jesus taking decision and telling his disciples, encouraging them, and telling them, telling them what will befall them, what will happen to him. And within this period, I discovered that he was withdrawn from the crowd, seeking for a, a quiet place where he could really have time for prayers, committing himself, and focusing on what he came to do, and also telling the disciples what they ought to do. Is humility to what he came to do was not questionable. He was so loyal, so committed, so obedient to what he came to do that people living around him would have not mistaken him to somebody who does not understand what he believed. There was this strong faith in Christ Jesus that produces holiness. A holiness that he came to spread, a holiness that he came to spread to man, to reconcile man back to God. But what surprises me is the attitude in comparison to what Jesus displayed as a faith and a concentration of loyalty to what he came to do. What surprises me if we compare the life of Judas Iscariot and what Jesus did. He was not a just passerby. He was not an a careless observer, but somebody who had been with Jesus to a point of being entrusted with the values and the activities of the group. He was a treasurer, as the Bible describes. And that, be, that means he must have been really trusted or there was hope that certainly someone who has been with God should be able to understand the rudiments of the group. But as the Bible said that the heart of man is desperately wicked. Inside of him, it was just a show. The loyalty was not there. The obedience was not there. Hence, the description of one of you will betray me. Jesus being God and knowing everything that would happen, did not allow that to distract him. But it was so shocking to discover that somebody within could perceive such evil. No wonder David would say it, that if it were my enemies, I would have known how to do And the Bible said that a man's enemy is a member of his household. While Judas Iscariot was displaying this act of disloyalty, I tem I'm tempted to ask, is it possible to do the right action from a wrong motive. I said, certainly God will not sanction it. God will not appreciate it. There is no way we are going to take a right action with a wrong motive. And I want to encourage us. The passion that we have, because it was this passion that drives Jesus to leave his throne, the passion to redeem mankind, the passion to reconcile us back to our Creator, the passion to make us who God wants us to be, the passion to restore us to the original status that we were being created for, the passion of making us to get back to how God has created us and what He expects of us. He decided to leave His throne and came down to show us 
how to live this life without any compromise with what is happening in our society. Child of God, I don't know, today we have so many churches, so many congregations, so many breakups, so many holy, group in, holy groups within the churches, and some being seen as unholy people. I want us to have a recount. I want us to have a rethink. In all these things, do we have a right motive towards it? Or we are just doing because of what we are going to take out of it? If our intention is not in line with the passion of Christ, which is to bring man back to a state of redemption, a level of reconciling man back to God, I think we have everything. We need to rescind our, our status. We need to rescind our action. We can see what befell Judas Iscariot. I am not sure he really intended to do it. But because his passion was not for souls, his passion was for wealth, his passion was for popularity, his passion was to be known and to belong. Probably because Jesus told him that his time will soon be up. And he wouldn't want to miss anything with his friends. So he would quickly rush to do those uh, uh, kind of sharp practices so that they would go back and then uh, belong to the world. Child of God, I want us to have everything. Our fellowship in the church, our commitment, attending church activities, is it really to bring glory to God? Or we are just doing it just for doing sin? Let me say that Jesus Christ within his time on earth, though young as we would describe it, but he was living a lasting legacy. A legacy that fulfilled what he came for. Setting man free from Satan's captivity. Our loyalty to God, is it to set people free, or we are just loyal to him, so that God will protect us from the powers of darkness, so that God will provide our needs, so that God will do uh, what our heart desires. Because it is true that when we seek him first, then every other thing will be added to us. Let us have everything. How many times, how loyal are we to our Creator? How loyal are we to our congregation? Do we sell out our congregation? Do we sell out Christ? Do we, or do we protect and preserve His tenets, His principles, and the holiness that He came to exhibit within us? I want to appeal to us. If our loyalty is questionable, if our obedience is not complete in Christ, it will be a total waste of time. And thank God that what we are seeing today is not rapture. Because the way it's taking us is quite unawares. That's why people are crying in their houses. Because there was no time for them to prepare, to keep money, to feed themselves. Some did not even have hope. And so the, the time of preparation was not quite up okay. And so people are being locked in without food. I want to appeal to us. Since this is not rapture, but a preparation towards it, let us turn back to God. Let us not betray Him. Let us not sell out our faith for anything. The 30 pieces of silver could not sustain the life of you that is carried, indicating that the life that we are living does not constitute what we possess. It is not whatever we have in life cannot preserve us, cannot keep us in tune with God. The only thing that will keep us is to be loyal to Him, to be obedient to His words, and then abide in Him. And by so doing, our society will be better. Our church will be better. And the heavens will be happy with us. And all the blessings we are seeking for will just come without further struggle. I pray that this world will bring meaning to us. Even as we continue to pray for the redemption of souls who are lost, this passion we can try to reconcile ourselves back to God and people around us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Our eternal Father, we pray, O oh Lord, that in your mercy you will forgive us. And this loyalty to you, we confess, Lord Jesus, that you are the Lord of Lords, the creator that existed without being made, of one being with the Father, and yet 
we go contrary to of glory to our confession of faith. We have watered down our faith that the outsiders, the unbelievers are mocking us, that we cannot really stand out to affirm our faith in you. Some of us have collected more than 30 silver, Father God, to betray the church, to betray the faith. Lord, today as we hear your words, we return to you. And I pray for as many out there who will have a change of heart because of this message. Lord, I plead that your spirit will come upon them that from today they will become holy. They will live, Father God, and enjoy your blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. Continue, Lord, to bless your church, even as we pray, King of Glory, for our nation and the entire world, especially to those King of Glory who are in the medical field, who are suffering this heat much. Lord, preserve them. Let them not perish in the course of their, their duties. Bless, Lord God Almighty, your church, that the gate of hell shall never prevail against your church. Have your way and let your name be glorified. May we feel your presence wherever we are. In the name of the Father and of the Son 